This is a passage from uh, Charles Bukowski's short story called A Couple of Winos, where Charles Bukowski, one of the two winos, is hired to do back-breaking work. And as soon as they, the, him and his partner get any money, once they're paid at the end of the day, it's a day, day job. Uh, it's a day job. They just drink themselves silly and get up and do it all over again. The first day of the job is described thus. Christ, when we woke up, the old guy was sick and I wasn't feeling much better. And the sun was up and out and we went out to do our job. Stacking railroad ties. You had to stack them into ricks. The bottom stacking was easy. <clears throat> but as we got higher, we had to count. One, two, three. I'd count and then we'd let her go. The old guy had a bandana tied around his head, and the booze poured out of his head and into the bandana, and the bandana got soaked in dark. Every now and then, a sliver from one of those railroad ties would knife through the rotten glove and into my hand. Ordinarily, the pain would have been unbearable, and I would have uh, quit, but fatigue dulled the senses. Really properly dulled them. I just got angry when that happened like I wanted to kill somebody. But when I looked around, there was only sand and cliffs and the oven-dry, bright yellow sun and no place to go. He's uh, doing this in the back roads of Southern California. <laughs> Every now and then, the railroad company would rip up the old ties and replace them with new ones. They left the old ties laying beside the tracks. There wasn't much wrong with the old ties, but the railroad left them laying around, and old Burkhart had guys like us stack them into ricks, which he toted off in his truck and sold. I guess they had a lot of uses. On some of the ranches, you'd see them stuck in the ground and strung with barbed wire and used as fences. I suppose there were other uses, too. I wasn't much interested. It was like any other impossible job. You got tired and you wanted to quit, then you got more tired and forgot to quit. And the minutes didn't move. You lived forever inside of one minute. No hope. No out. Trapped. Too dumb to quit. And nowhere to go if you did quit. <laughs> um, that's uh, one of the most colorful depictions of a Sisyphean existence that I've come across in literature. And Charles Bukowski is pretty good at portraying life as fundamentally pointless and crazy and um, futile. Um, he, uh, he raises an awful lot of interesting points in this passage. Um, they had to do this impossible, stupid job that made other people some money. They got paid ne next to nothing, but what they did get paid, they wasted anyways. They just got drunk. Um, at the end of the story, it doesn't really blow the plot, uh, so you know, um, they end up, uh, once the job is done, going down to a brothel and blowing the remainder of their money there. Um, <clears throat> so they really, one could say they're being ripped off, but they really have no use for money anyway. Um, so even the pay that they do get, the small benefit that they do get out of doing this impossible job is ultimately just sort of some other weird, stupid distraction to forget about how pointless everything is. Now, the interesting thing is, though, that... It doesn't really, uh, the, the short story doesn't really seem to portray an unbearable existence in as much as it portrays a pointless one, a futile one. Um, and another interesting, uh, if we want to use this passage as a metaphor for life, another u u interesting passage, and I don't know if it was meant like this, was the, the last bit where he said, too dumb to quit and nowhere to go if you did quit, or the other one where he gets knifed through the hand by the uh, big sliver uh, threw his gloves into his hand and he gets so angry that he wants to kill somebody and he turns around and there's just the empty desert out there. Uh, there's, there's no point in even getting angry about anything. That's kind of interesting, those two passages, because it struck me as though it's almost a challenge to the, uh, the sufferings of life, the pointlessness of life itself. Trying to be pointless is pointless. <laughs> Futility is futile. Um, after a while, okay, it's just futile. More futility. And 
uh, it wears off the, the 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 horror of being stuck in this endless moment uh, just becomes another or, or being horrified at it becomes more or less impossible the longer you're at the futile job it's just something that's happening even futility itself loses its its sting after long enough familiarity with it um, and <clears throat> it reminds me of my brush with depression it was a bad one about I don't know 20 25 years ago where I was often obsessed with the idea of suicide I'm gonna do something about this I've had enough never even got close never never even decided on a method um, all I would do is fantasize about it all the time but never really even got slightly close to pulling it all off or, or even as I say figuring out a time and place to do it it just I don't know it never seemed to get to that point or it never seemed to be uh, feasible and I think that again that seemed to be a futile thing if I'm going to kill myself because of the futility and pointless and emptiness of my life well okay what's to say that that isn't a futile gesture as well it's it, when you're in that kind of state when you're in I think it's called white depression I think you're you're incapable of, do, of even summoning the initiative to kill yourself in in many cases and in my case it seems to have been that way um, I uh, I just why bother because you're, you're stuck with the notion that everything is futile so what makes you think offing yourself is going to change anything um, you know it's uh, you, you're at that level of despair but again um, a lot of people have said this you often have to get to that point before you can climb back out of the pit I don't know I who knows what goes on in here I you know I've had my head shrunk a number of times but I haven't figured it all out yet but it wouldn't surprise me if we were somehow to f able to find these things out conclusively that I'd actually I had to get to that point before I could actually climb back out I don't know I had to get to the point where even any possible solution to any of my problems including suicide was basically just yeah yawn whatever you know, uh, the sheer stupid banality of suicide itself uh, eventually prevented me from killing myself. And <clears throat> I think that Bukowski in inserted that into this story, into this idea that, okay, do something decisive then. <laughs> what is there to do that's decisive? Um, like okay you, you, the, the, we have, our society has a huge taboo around suicide and we mystify it and everything um, and that kind of gives it a sort of force that it doesn't really deserve if you ask me all you're doing is hastening a death that's going to come in the natural scheme of things anyway so you know you, a lot of people who have come back from the same place I was in severe depression eventually came to see suicide in that way it's it isn't even a a, a solution worth considering it's not like, well, what's that gonna solve you know I, I, I this is a problem that I need to deal with and uh, suicide ends up seeming to be some sort of I don't know flight from it from a problem that is just gonna keep chasing you uh, that you can't just sort of say I'm gonna end it all now I, I understand the objections to that but what we're talking about a a mood disorder here where you're not seeing things clearly your your emotions have basically taken over and the emotions of futility and anxiety and panic and and bleakness and blackness and everything like that are irrational and they cloud your judgment and you know you you can be forgiven for thinking that suicide is not going to solve any of your problems and it's not going to uh, it's not going to end anything and it's just stupid I think suicide is a fairly significant event but uh, I think that uh, that a lot of people, and I've spoken to some people like this, who just sort of thought that that it's not even just a cowardly way out; it's just a stupid way to to deal with something. I'm not saying that I believe this, by the way, but this is how I was thinking at the time, and I can see how the stupidity and pointlessness of attempting to deal with everything by killing yourself can, you know, it it, it can stop you when it was it was the emotions of futility and pointlessness that brought you to suicide in the first place. And this is the interesting thing about the myth of, myth of Sisyphus. Okay, you're going to have to push that rock up, have it knocked down, and push it back up again for ever. <laughs> uh, you can never not do that. 
It's like my old thing about insanity. Okay, let's say you're stuck in existence for all eternity. Okay, you go insane because you can't take, you can't handle that kind of existence forever. After a billion years, you've had enough and you go insane. Okay, <laughs> you've still got eternity. After a billion years, your your sanity is returned to you again, and now you're stuck there in existence. Okay, now what? Okay, well, I go insane again. Okay, well, you go insane again. Now what? <laughs> um, that's, again, that's Sisyphean, isn't it? Pointlessness. Uh, but pointlessness, true pointlessness, <laughs> coming as a solution to feelings of futility and pointlessness. Maybe people who, who believe that life is futile haven't quite gotten to the point where they truly do believe it's futile yet. <laughs> because if you do sort of truly believe that life is futile, um, I can't, or that everything is futile, I can't even see suicide having any interest for you. Um, why bother? Uh, you know, it, it resolves any kind of fear of death. It's, uh, if, you, if you're consciously aware of the fact that you're standing on a trap door with a noose around your neck and your finger on the, on the uh, lever, you just go click and that's the end of it uh, at all times, uh, and you choose not to do that, then you might get a slightly cynical view of yourself saying, look, yeah, you, you don't even have the guts to do that. Okay, that's futility in dealing with yourself. And so you have to, I think, in many ways, or a lot of people to get sort of out of the fear of futility, they have to experience true futility. Um, the, uh, the kind of futility where, and I felt this, where it's difficult to walk, where you're overwhelmed by the feeling of pointlessness to the point where you wonder why should I even bother lifting one leg and putting it down and then doing it to the other leg and putting that one down um, because it's it's all just a waste of time um, I you know again that's some people don't think that life is quite that futile but they consider themselves to be quite pessimistic um, I don't know when you're really pessimistic, you've lost the capacity to sort of be surprised by anything, to be offended by anything, to be bothered by anything that happens in the news, or to be worried about anything. You don't care anymore. It's just futile to care about anything. So, <clears throat> I think that a lot of the issues of uh, futility in life are often um, are often only soluble if you actually manage to work it out in your head what it is about futility and pointlessness uh, that actually bothers you. Um, if you're, I think that the problem is, in many cases, people believe that life is futile, but they somehow think that it shouldn't be. <laughs> or that maybe if the circumstances were right, it wouldn't be. Um, I think that a lot of people in, in, a, in a situation where they do believe that their life has become Sisyphean, sort of, they don't really have a, a complaint against uh, existence itself in as much as they have a complaint against their own circumstances or their own situation in life, and they don't know what that complaint is. So they blame it on stuff. Um, but the problem is, of course, okay, if, if I want to know what is bothering me, and that's one of the terrible things about a mood disorder, you don't know what the hell is bothering you. There is nothing bothering you. I used to liken it to the old man sitting on my back and yelling in my ears all the time and banging my chest with his heels from uh, the uh, the story of, uh, well, the, the original story from the Thousand and One Nights, uh, Sinbad, or I think it was, where that's what happened to him. It, that's what it felt like. There was something around me constantly restraining me and interfering in everything that I attempted to do and weighting me down and all that kind of thing. Um, you often have to sort of get into that kind of sense of, if I, you know, or you often sort of think, just get this guy off my back and everything is fine. That's not a, quite a sense of futility yet. What the sense of futility is, he's there, he's part of the way things are, and that's that. Now what? <laughs> um, I think that a lot of people who suffer from uh, depression and anxiety and mood disorders and things of this nature are often sort of clinging to some sort of hope um, or insidiously some sort of belief. They think that they don't believe in anything, 
but they do. They think that they don't believe in love anymore, or that they don't believe in justice, or happiness, or whatever. Um, it's possible that they honestly don't believe in these things, and I understand that. But I should not be at all surprised if a lot of people who say that they don't believe in these things secretly do, and they don't believe themselves when they tell themselves that they don't believe in it. And this is what causes the pain. They are torn between acceptance and non-acceptance of futility. If you actually believe that love is fake, um, then why would you secretly want it? Oh, I think that a lot of people actually are in that situation. Uh, they think that wealth is useless, but they wouldn't say no to a pile of it. They think that um, love is a waste of time, uh, but they wouldn't run from it. It's another thing about Bukowski. He was he never tired of lambasting himself for his own massive hypocrisies. He thought women were idiots, and as soon as he got um, wealth and power, or power, not power, as soon as he got wealth and fame, the good-looking women that who had al always rejected him in his life suddenly flocked to him, and he embraced all of it. <laughs> um, he uh, had always lived as a tough guy, living by his wits, doing impossible jobs, as he describes in these books. As soon as he made money off his books, he um, bought a nice house in San Pedro, California, and uh, lived quite a nice life. Gave up drinking the horrible, cheap rot gut he'd been drinking, and started to drink imported French wine, etc. With a very good-looking wife. And he attacked himself relentlessly for giving in like this. Um... And it's not that people forgave him, but I think a lot of people identified with him. Um, the fact that he had such a negative view of himself that he couldn't adhere to his own principles, um, and that he, all the things that he despised in everybody when he was poor, he suddenly found he wanted as soon as he got rich. And he wrote about himself when he got to that stage. Some of his best work is, is what took place after he had made it. And, and most of it is about what a phony he believed himself to be um, for being that way. And you wonder, what kind of a fascinating exercise is that? Um, what is it that makes this kind of writing so appealing? I'm a phony, and I'm angry about the fact that I'm a phony, but I don't hate myself for it, because he certainly didn't hate himself for any of that. Um, I think that he just had that sneering kind of cynical laugh that he, you know, used against so many other things in his life, and it, that turned on himself. So look what look what a big fake I am, you know. Look what a big hypocrite I am, living in my nice big house with my beautiful wife, and you know, all these cats in a swimming pool in the backyard drinking ex in imported French wine. Um, when all these years I, I was the tough guy brawling in the back alleys and everything, despising people who live like this. Uh, well, looks like he overcame futility, didn't he? And it looks like that the futility that he thought he felt and that he uh, illustrated so effectively in uh, a couple of winos um, wasn't quite as futile as he thought it was. Maybe, in his own way, he was offering a message that, okay, there's nothing wrong with actually finding something to like about in life. To like in life. Um, even if it's sitting in front of the TV set eating popcorn. If you like that, by all means, do it. Don't have any illusions about yourself, about what you're doing. Um, there's no harm in liking doing something, but don't think that you're doing anything profound or that you're, you're any better than anybody else. If, you're ac if you actually are um, attached to the idea of the futility of everything, then that futility, that idea of futility, will not drive you to despair. If things are futile, they're truly futile. And even despair and even ultimately, I guess, suicide, self-destruction, or all these other impetuses towards annihilation or whatever are futile as well. Um, I think that we've decided that futility has an inherently negative quality to it, where in fact, it may not, um, depending on how, again, we want to look at it. 
It's only futile if we insist that it should be something else. Or it's only futile if we secretly believe that if it wasn't so futile, we'd still like it so much. Or if we got other things that we actually want in life, we wouldn't consider it futile. How, do, how does one know when one truly believes that it, this is all futile? Or maybe are we just kidding ourselves and we simply are dissatisfied with not getting the goodies that we perceive other people to have? Who knows? Uh, but it's a good argument towards continuous and ongoing, perhaps endless, self-examination. <laughs>